Thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you also for, for the invite. Uh, it's great to be here online. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm just going to start. And um, so as you can see the title, it's uh, looking at um, ocean wave uh, generated seismic noise that is observed in Ireland and looking at some kind of connection then with uh, uh, the North Atlantic climate variability. Uh, so just to start off, uh, so storms, they kind of uh, um, include a lot of energy. Uh, and I guess the main, the main interest here is to, to understand better all the, the storm energy that is recorded as seismic waves um, can give a better insight of, of some kind of unique interconnection between the, the solid earth and, and the, the ocean, uh, as well as global as atmospheric processes. So I just maybe uh, a good part of the, the group here is familiar with this, but I, I wanted to mention a bit uh, what is a micro seismic noise that we're interested in. So on the top right, uh, you have a seismogram where you would have usually people would be mainly interested in earthquakes, uh, but all the other part, which is noise, um, is dominated by, um, by actually uh, ocean generated um, uh, seismic waves uh, and looking at a, a noise spectrum here from Ireland of that noise uh, we can see the kind of classic signature of, of what is expected for, for, for noise in general recorded on seismometers. So there's two types of ocean generated uh, microseism. Um, the first type is called a primary microseism between 10 and 20 seconds as uh, you can see here on the spectrum. So this type of noise, it's mainly coming from uh, direct interaction of ocean waves with bathymetry. And the signal is recorded at the same period as ocean waves. Uh, the depth sensitivity is half of uh, ocean wavelengths, meaning that this type of noise is generated uh, in shallow waters. Um, then you have the second component, which is actually the most dominant on, on land recordings. It's secondary microseism um, between three and 10 seconds. So this one is a bit more complex. It's um, characterized by, its generation is characterized by the, um, having a configuration of uh, opposing ocean waves uh, in, that are interacting and leading to second order uh, pressure variations. So the interesting thing about this, this type of noise here, the secondary microseism is that they can be generated in any water depths. And uh, one of the dominant character characteristics as well is that uh, the recorded signal represents uh, half the period of the ocean waves. So for the rest of the presentation, actually, this is uh, mainly the, the one I'll be looking at, so secondary microseism. Um, the dominating seismic waves associated with ocean microseism uh, are mainly surface waves. There is also body waves, but in amplitude, the surface waves are, are definitely dominating. Um, so you would have the Rayleigh waves with a particle motion as a ellipse and the uh, love waves as well, um, which are like more transverse uh, motion in the ground. Uh, the theory for understanding the Rayleigh wave generation has been, has been uh, quite well established by now, uh, but there's still some questions remaining on how do you get uh, love waves generated from, um, from ocean waves, uh, basically. Uh, so why, why does all this matter? Um, so as you probably have seen now for, for a bit of time, um, there's been a, quite a big revolution in seismology with um, this type of noise being used for passive seismic imagery, but also monitoring of um, changes in the subsurface. Um, then it can also be used for uh, ocean wave climate monitoring. Like uh, here's an example of comparing um, ocean wave height uh, from, from uh, buoy data in, in the sea with uh, the seismic amplitudes recorded on land. So it matches pretty well. Uh, and even maybe plan on a more longer term uh, comparison and, and look at uh, cl climate trends uh, through time, which has been done in this study by Grave Mayer 2000, where they tried to correlate uh, different um, climate components with some kind of macro seismic index, which is directly derived from changes in um, 
uh, my concern is noise uh, amplitude through time. Uh, so the content here, um, so first I'm going to try to go um, and, and look at how do we locate and understand those secondary macrosame sources. So looking at the source localization from Ireland and then comparing it with uh, three numerical simulations to study propagation effects. Uh, then I will go into secondary macrosame love waves, uh, understand, try to understand our generation factors and how uh, continental margins influence uh, their energy. And finally, I will try to, as I was saying, uh, extrapolate to um, North Atlantic climate viability observed from actually uh, OBS data and, and the noise recorded on uh, some OBS data. Uh, so on locating and understanding the noise, uh, secondary microsystem sources, um, so source locations um, can be derived from ocean wave models. So the work from uh, Fabrice Ardouin in, in Ifremer has, has done um, like a, a great, like it's uh, like you can even get the data available uh, online. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, so on the left is kind of the different um, configuration that are implemented in the model to, to, ge to generate those uh, locations for noise. So it's basically looking at configuration for ocean wave interactions. So you could have either uh, one storm interacting with itself. Um, then you could have reflection of the coast where you would have then uh, those opposite uh, ocean wave front configurations. And you could also have in the, um, in the sea uh, part here, even two storms that end up interacting with each other. And then you could have also this uh, opposite uh, ocean wave fronts uh, happening. So having those different configuration in, in the model, they can kind of derive at the top right picture here, kind of the wave, what's called the wave forcing uh, at the ocean surface, uh, which is the equivalent pressure that is really resulting from this um, nonlinear ocean wave wave interaction. Uh, those are also called P2L well data, actually, if you go on the Iowaga project on the framer. To, to actually get those maps. And then the, the bottom right picture is uh, seismic sources, which are basically combining this uh, ocean wave forcing with uh, local side effects from, from bathymetry. Uh, then you could have also source localization there from seismic stations. So, so far in the literature, the dominant um, approaches are either single station um, polarization analysis where People have analyzed um, uh, the, um, the particular um, elliptical motion of Rayleigh waves and, and derive some kind of localization of where they are coming from. And uh, also you would have the option of seismic array analysis where then you have a cluster of stations that you use as an array to, to kind of track back uh, the origin of the signal. Um, and more recently, there have been uh, people uh, that tried to attempt to do macro seismic um, macro source inversion, uh, which is quite nice. Like uh, this is an example from the, the study of Eagle et al. Uh, 2021. Uh, they actually have all this on, on the website. So they upload um, this inversion data on the website. So the way it works is they are using seismic stations from land mainly. And uh, using cross correlation, they, they aim to, to, um, to exploit the symmetry asymmetry properties of cross correlations to kind of point back at where the signal might be coming from. Uh, so, in our case, we are doing the classical array analysis here from Ireland. So, we looked at one year, one year of data. So you have the, the example on the right with a strong. Um, secondary uh, micro saves energy between three and 10 seconds for the one year between March 2016 and March 2017. So we have two arrays which are located both uh, one in the north of Ireland and one in the, in the south of Ireland. Uh, so in terms of the results um, over this full year, it's quite interesting like because the, the localization of the sources happen to be very localized uh, near, near the continental shelf, uh, not for all period bands, but mainly for the, the short period bands and, and even actually, even if it's more spread, also for the bit longer period of the secondary macro season. So we were not wondering why, why is this going on when, when, the, when we look at the ocean wave model, the source distribution is, is quite wide. So why do we see that from a 
So that's why we, we went towards a numerical simulation. So we build a, a 3D model uh, aiming to cover a good portion of the um, uh, Irish offshore and then uh, apply numerical simulation using uh, Spectrum 3D Cartesian here, which enable full waveform uh, modeling of acoustic and seismic propagation. So in this model, in this model, um, there is four four layers. Um, so it's quite simple, but still uh, we try to um, to keep the interfaces as realistic as possible. So there is a water layer which is here acoustic. Then uh, we included the sediment layer with different velocity um, um, layering, uh, cross layer as well, and and the mountain. Uh, for the first example I'm going to show, the source is, is, uh, is a very simple point source located uh, 15 meters below the sea surface. Um, so it's an acoustic source and its, uh, its source time function is a recall wavelet of, of five second dominant period and, and in the vertical direction. So um, as I was saying, yeah, we try to be as realistic as possible with interfaces. So here is um, the sediment thickness from the the world uh, sediments uh, from NOAA. And uh, here I put also the, we try to take the, the more from this uh, epicrust uh, model. So you can see that uh, the area is very complex uh, from this kind of North East Atlantic uh, hyper extended margin. And therefore we expect a lot of uh, local interactions and, and propagation effects that can be seen on simulations. Uh, so yeah, the question is also 3D propagation effects can affect um, the acoustic seismic waves propagation. So here's an example of this single point source simulation located in the deep water and it's kind of uh, spreading away and you can see as it's hitting the, the main um, shelf, there's kind of a, a change somehow in the, in, in the wave propagation. I just let it go one last time. Um, so yeah, the, there is a big change actually in bathymetry right right here, and you can see the wave is kind of um, kind of deviated and following the the edge of the shelf uh, as it continues propagation. So we applied this um, again array analysis, but this time on the synthetic data. So the synthetic data from this simulation, and uh, it's quite interesting because if we look at the first arrival, which would be here the the P waves. Uh, we could see that they are pointing more or less at the origin of the of the of the signal, which is the, the acoustic source. Whereas, if we look at the, the Rayleigh wave here, uh, dominant Rayleigh wave signal um, for the surface waves, uh, the locations are more ambiguous and and kind of dominate more around this uh, interaction with the shelf, uh, which is quite interesting. And then, um, as I was saying, yeah, there is this kind of strong interaction that we can see here. And then the shelf seems to be acting like a waveguide and redirecting the, the, the origin of the signal too. Uh, and as some perspectives, what we are trying to do as well uh, is since we have the model through a collaboration with uh, Matthias Fink, uh, we started looking at time reversal imaging. So kind of, the principle would be to um, uh, back propagate uh, the signal recorded and, 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 and get some kind of refocus at the origin of the source. So that's kind of the way it works here in this example. Um, you have two examples. One is um, positive time, uh, you put that time plus and time minus. So the positive time is kind of the point source forward simulation. And the negative time uh, simulation is kind of getting the signal recorded from the forward simulation, uh, reversing it in time and filling it back in the model. And you can see it's, it's refocusing at, um, at the original source, which is quite interesting. And if there is potential maybe to use that to image the noise sources, that would be uh, quite nice. Uh, but it's a bit more complex in reality than just a single point source. Um, so, so far I've just tried to apply the, a few tests. So um, I used a few stations from Ireland. I did a forward simulation um, and I tried to apply the back propagation of the reverse signal uh, in the model and, uh, and see uh, how it's refocusing at the original point source. So, this is still in progress, but it's, it's quite interesting that 
it works quite well for a point source. The question now is, yeah, for, for a bigger um, widespread um, realistic source, would it be as uh, efficient? Um, so now I'm moving on to love wave generation factors. Um, so there's been several um, uh, hypotheses on what could be the, the um, the factors that that kind of lead to observing um, love waves uh, as kind of secondary macroseism signal. So it goes from like maybe the, the first one that people would think of is having a, some kind of ink light surface would then generate transverse seismic waves that could then uh, end up propagating as love waves. Uh, people have also looked at um, internal scatterings, like having highly heterogeneous medium can influence on the um, relate to love wave conversions. Um, the role of sediments also has been pointed out in, in relate to love wave conversions, like conversions at uh, edges of sediments. And um, related to love, all of that, it's quite interesting, for example, on the, the picture on the right, um, this is um, a study looking at love to relay wave energy ratio. And it's maybe hard to see, but um, the, the circles kind of represent um, uh, the numbers of, of the ratio. So the external circle is 1.5, then it's one in the middle, and they are 0 0.5 for the smallest one. And you can see that even for Europe, um, there's already quite a big change of what's going on between Ireland, which is 0 0.5, and, and stationed in Germany, which shows ratios closer to one. And intuitively, we, we could kind of think uh, we would expect higher ratios near Ireland being closer to the dominant sources in the Atlantic and maybe lower ratios in inland, which is quite interesting. Uh, there's been also like a, a very nice study recently uh, looking at uh, love wave generation. So it's like a global study um, incorporating um, directly the, the ocean wave, uh, <coughs> ocean wave. Uh, um, surface uh, pressure maps as, as a source for the simulation. So um, it, it's quite uh, inclusive of all of that. Uh, they concluded a, a small contribution from uh, bathymetric inclines and, and a major contribution from um, 3D Earth heterogeneity. So as the wave field is propagating in the Earth, the 3D Earth heterogeneity is uh, as a main um, the main component in, in love wave generation. Uh, and then they kind of looked at the type of ratios that you could see um, on different stations all around the globe. So it, it was quite nice to, to see that. Uh, in our case, we, we aim for um, a very simple uh, a model first, um, because we wanted to um, under, have an understanding of the wave fields uh, in, in, in a very local um, aspect and, and see how it's kind of evolving through a very simple um, morphology. So here what we have is just um, <clears throat> a change in bathymetry and a change in, in um, uh, sedimentary basin. So you can see a sedimentary basin in the middle with um, uh, introduced some kind of lateral uh, change to see the the way this might affect the radiation of the wave field. And similarly uh, for the, the change in bathymetry here. And then we have two profiles of stations, P1 and P2, that are crossing those two um, lateral um, changes in the, in the morphologies. Uh, then with this model, uh, the way we designed it is we can then change uh, either uh, the bathymetry changes, the sediment thickness, or also uh, the different velocities and see how they affect the wave field uh, as, it, as it propagates. So first we tested for this uh, bathymetry influence. So having a source, uh, so here now looking at this profile P1, we're located in the, the shallower part here. So having a source right on top of the bathymetry incline, uh, we can see it's generating um, transverse uh, signal here as love waves, but the, the amplitude it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite low compared to the, the vertical component. And it's kind of in agreement with what the uh, study from World Theory 2020 was, was saying as well, uh, that bathymetry is, is not enough to, to generate high amplitude um, love waves. Uh, now we are looking at having the source right on top of the, um, the edge of the sedimentary basin here. Uh, and so it would be located here on the, on the model, basically, on this point. 
So now we can see um, very more um, comparable amplitudes for vertical, radial, and transverse signals. With here on the, the red, the red um, signals would be the transverse signals or low waves here, which you can see that kind of shifted in time um, compared to the, the vertical signal, which is quite interesting. And uh, then if we look at um, the wave field in, in space, so here are snapshots of, of the simulation. So on the left is a transverse component and on the right is a vertical component. Uh, so you can see first on the transverse components where the source location, um, the radiation is, is, is kind of particular, as you can see the orientation of this uh, unconformity that I was showing on the sediment edge is kind of controlling the, the radiation of the transverse signal as if you have a perfect perpendicular to the to the sediment basin edge here, uh, there, is, there is no significant amplitude, uh, which is not the same for the vertical um, component of the signal. And then in terms of the propagation, you can see on the, on the, on the time as uh, 164 seconds that uh, the love waves is, is uh, in front of the vertical signal that is uh, coming later, which is what we see as well on, on the data. But it's quite nice to see it on the, on the, um, uh, in space, basically. And also looking at the wave field is quite useful as well because you can see, uh, we can see some artifacts coming in um, in the simulation, like the absorbing layers are not perfect. And it's good to be aware of those so that then you can, you can identify them as well in the signal. Uh, so I'm not going detail into that, but I just wanted to say that although the, meta, the model is very simple, uh, the wave field is, is massive complex. Uh, looking at the station located in the sedimentary basin here, station seven, we try to um, compare having different velocities for the sediment uh, basin and looking at uh, the type of um, seismic surface wave modes that we could recover in terms of low waves and Rayleigh waves. So those modes uh, are plotted as uh, group velocities and they are compared with um, the theoretical um, expected group velocities uh, for a 1D simple model. So you can see as, as you get um, lower and lower um, velocities of the sedimentary basin, um, the, there is more and more modes involved and it becomes even very difficult to identify uh, each of them um, individual. Uh, and what is interesting then is looking at the way they, that the wave field then interact with uh, each side of the model, uh, we can see that as we move toward the shallow water on the shelf, uh, all relay and love waves become mainly um, fundamental modes through conversions. Uh, and the same as we move further into the deeper water, but outside the um, sedimentary model, the sedimentary basin, um, the love waves are dominated by fundamental mode and uh, Rayleigh wave dominated, dominated by um, uh, higher mode, first of all. Uh, so now we were wondering in terms of Rayleigh to love wave conversion. So basically placing a source where we wouldn't expect um, any generation of transverse signal right below the source. So kind of putting the source of our flat area, but see how it interacts with the model to generate uh, eventually some love waves. So this is done by here placing the source right on top of the middle of the sedimentary basin and see how that propagates. Uh, as we can see, as it's going uh, further into deep water, um, we, we can see the love wave component of the fundamental mode here and the higher mode again of the relay waves. Uh, looking at the, the snapshots again, uh, as, as, as expected, uh, near the zero time of the, the source inception, uh, there is no nothing going on on the transverse signal. But as we move, as the wave field evolves uh, closer to the edges of the sedimentary basin, we can see a generation of transverse signal again with this uh, particular radiation pattern uh, affected by the Kind of the orientation of the of the sedimentary slope here. Uh, so now, if we compare this kind of 
uh, we try to understand the structural control over the, um, this love to relay wave energy ratio. So we look at in those two different approaches, either having a love wave generation with a source located on top of the sedimentary slope or with a source located uh, in the middle of a sedimentary basin for looking uh, for um, relay to love wave conversions. So in this case, we look at the, the first case where the source is on top of the sedimentary slope. And, and try to look at the changes in ratio for receiver one and receiver two with the changing bathymetry and um, sedimentary basin thickness as well as velocities uh, for two different uh, period bands, three to five seconds and six to eight, sec eight seconds. So what we can see is there is a lot going on here, a um, lot of changes happening, but overall it's kind of quite consistent that we obtain uh, stronger ratios for lower velocities in the sedimentary basin. There is also um, uh, some kind of control of being looking at receiver one or receiver two changes in the in the ratios depending on the azimuth. This is associated with uh, what I was talking about regarding this uh, particular radiation pattern for the for the love waves. Uh, so there is a strong um, structural control here on the the way the signal radiates. And looking at the relative really love wave conversion, so in the case I was saying, having this source in the middle of sedimentary basin and seeing how oh, it's kind of converting as as the signal is is eating uh, heterogeneities, uh, we can see overall um, the the ratios are are, are weaker, uh, but still we see a, a control of if we have a strong stronger contrast um, between the sediments and the crust, we can end up with um, stronger ratios. Uh, an interesting uh, uh, observation that we saw as well is actually, I didn't plot it here, but um, the, um, the love wave amplitude will fluctuate, of course, with uh, changing ocean depths and environment. But it seems to be actually the, the relay wave amplitudes that really control the love to relay wave ratio. So, for example, we having low sediments, it's going to be mainly the damping of the relay waves that will really increase the, the love to relay wave ratio, which is quite interesting. Uh, so now we're looking at all continental margins uh, influence uh, energy of love waves. So we go back to this uh, regional model that we that we had and, and try to incorporate um, a more extended source in the simulation. So it's kind of considering um, a multipoint source simulation defined um, by the, the model P2L surface uh, that I mentioned previously, which is um, equivalent pressure at the surface resulting from nonlinear ocean wave interactions. And uh, that is available thanks to uh, Fabrice Ardouin via the Ifremer project and, and the Ifremer FTP. So what uh, we did here is we considered the median of the P2L data over a year, so the same year as the real data. And, and fed it through uh, single points here to cover kind of a map, a source map uh, over the, the regional model. So to do that, uh, following personal communication with uh, Lucia Gualteri at AGU 2019, uh, she advised us to consider including the, the P2L spectrum uh, directly in the simulation. So we, we followed that advice and, and, and use that to generate some kind of um, pressure signal that is then injected at each point here in the simulation. And so we generate that, we feed that for a certain amount of time, then record the signal and do again the array analysis. So what you can see here on the array analysis is the, um, the contours are the synthetic um, results plotted on top of the, the real data uh, array analysis that I showed in the previous slides. So it's, it's very interesting to see um, like strong similarities, particularly for, um, for the short period bands, uh, like having here the source located uh, dominantly on the northwest of the model, we can still see again that uh, the focus of the, of the beam forming, it's, it's located near the shelf. Um, it doesn't match as well for the, um, for the longer period component of the signal, but this, I guess, can be explained by a lot of factors. First of all, the, the model is only an approximation. We are only covering actually a small part of the, of the, of the whole picture. I mean, this is only a, a small uh, window box of the North Atlantic. And there is, of course, way more contributions in the, in the real data. 
Then if we compare the real and synthetic uh, loft to railway wave ratio estimated at, at both arrays, uh, we can see they're kind of in, in agreement. Of course, they are not perfect, but uh, it's, it's nice to see that we managed to recover um, similar ratios uh, somehow, as we can see on the real data, which is kind of comforting on all the um, kind of all the structural controls that we see through the simple model. Uh, uh, we think they kind of come into play somehow um, in the more complex morphologies as different contributions that kind of, um, yeah, it's kind of a summation of the changes in the source amplitude at different locations, the propagation effects, uh, sediment velocities, the changes in the mole, all, all of those kind of generating, um, uh, yeah, the, the conditions that create uh, different ratios. Uh, so then we aim to look at what people have seen um, in love to early wave ratios uh, around the world. Um, so for, for our study here, we are in Ireland, so we see around 0 0.5, 0 0.4. And as I was saying, uh, previous studies have seen uh, higher ratios um, further inland Europe. Uh, so we were, we were wondering maybe this could be related to having uh, here these very thick sediments in the North Sea with a kind of a north-south orientation of the sedimentary basin and maybe um, uh, noise sources present here would kind of radiate strong uh, transverse signals towards Central Europe um, that could explain maybe seeing higher ratios. Whereas if we consider signal coming directly from the, from the west, there is a lot of uh, changes in morphologies along the way that could affect the propagation of the signal as well for what could be seen further inland. Uh, more recent studies also have, have, have talked about the, maybe the influence of um, uh, the root of, of mountains in the, in the changes in the radiation pattern as well of really and love waves as they propagate. Um, so there is probably uh, way more involved in, in those propagation effects as we already pass in, in the inland propagation. Um, so I was saying, yeah, there's a lot of parameters involved from sediment thickness, velocity structures, basin morphology, the lateral extents of uh, the morphology as well, bathymetry, stations positions, and also the source distribution. Um, then we try to compare with what's going on in other countries, uh, like in Japan, there's been studies showing ratios of 0 0.4, 0 0.6, which is similar to Ireland. And uh, they have also like a strong change in bathymetry here, which probably would influence the way the, the signal is radiating. Um, there's a lot of sedimentary basins around as well that might influence um, the love wave ratios. Uh, for the Western US, it's interesting because there is, I think the 0 0.5 estimates was an average over a long period of time, but um, the 1.2 and 0 0.8 were only uh, obtained uh, for studies through um, a few days, which kind of uh, probably highlights the location of the source and the amplitude of the source as well in, the, in its influence in the, um, in the ratio of the estimates. Uh, so now I'm moving towards the uh, North Atlantic climate variability observed from uh, OBS data. So what, what we had an experiment in uh, 2016 when we had um, OBS stations uh, deployed offshore um, Donegal, uh, so which is in north, north of Ireland. Uh, so we had stations located in, in the shallow water and stations located in deeper water. Um, in this area, this area is called the, local, the Rockal Trough, and it's actually um, composed of very, very thick sedimentary basin around uh, I think it's uh, maybe three kilometer and three kilometer depth as well for the water layer. Uh, so here's an example of the uh, secondary macrocase recorded at uh, station ORK10, which is uh, one of the deepest located in the, in the middle of the, of the basin. And uh, we were actually interested to look at the, the wave field in terms of cross correlations to see uh, so basically here I put, I'm sure a lot of people here are familiar with the cross correlation in, in, in seismology, but I just wanted to put it as a, as a reminder maybe for, for um, people with different backgrounds. Um, so basically we're using the cross correlation here to extract the surface wave, wave, wave field. Uh, 
And the principle is that station uh, A and B take respectively the role as of the source and receiver and vice versa. And um, it's kind of um, simulating yeah, the, the wave field as if A was a source and B was a receiver and, 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 and so on. So it's simplifying the wave field and, and uh, unable to understand maybe a bit more the modes that are excited uh, locally if we look at uh, two stations, for example. So we did that for stations located on, on land, uh, here the two stations here on land, two stations located in the shallow water, stations three and four, and two stations located in the, in the deep water, uh, station eight and, and nine. And uh, the results were quite interesting because we saw that for, um, for land and shallow water, the, the wave field is dominated by um, really fundamental mode which is actually in agreement with uh, the, the simulation that I previous, previously showed where the wave field converts into fundamental mode as it's moved towards shallow waters. Uh, but we thought it was quite interesting to see kind of a change in time on the, on the deeper stations. So you can see that there's two modes here, a really higher mode uh, with a faster apparent velocity and a really fundamental mode. Uh, which is kind of seem to be dominant in the, um, in the months of February and March towards earlier April. But then the, the higher mode uh, seems to kind of take over as, as we move further towards uh, uh, the end of April and, and, and summer. So we were wondering if this could be related to a change in the, um, in the source locations. So having maybe uh, different configurations going on in, in the area. So for that, we looked at uh, the, the directional ocean wave spectrum at the K4 location. So K4 is here, the triangle on the map. Uh, so this is not real data, but it's, uh, it's again the data from the Ephraimer uh, models. So it's looking in detail as um, the, the way that as a polar diagram, looking at where the ocean waves are, the, the azimuths of the ocean waves and, and looking at um, modeled um, directions and, and expect maybe to see which cases we could see uh, opposite directions of similar periods. So this is what is plotted here on the, as, a, as a circle. It's kind of trying to point to, to, um, to monitor somehow the, um, the, the times where we would expect uh, opposing waves uh, interacting right at the location of K4. So it's maybe a bit hard to see, but there's way more um, points uh, happening as we move further in time. So further in time towards the summer months, and we interpreted this as kind of having more local uh, sources going on right on top of the basin and therefore exciting uh, locally the higher modes on the, on the OBSs. But to uh, understand that e even further, we, we try to go back to some uh, simple simulations. So here we have two configurations. Uh, one configuration is kind of a transition from the shelf to a sedimentary basin. And the second one is a transition from a deep water to a sedimentary basin, still in deep water, but uh, slightly shallower. So we look first at having the source uh, outside, so located either on the on the shelf or on the deeper water, and see what we recover on the cross correlation of the two OBS stations. So you can see on the plots here that it's it's mainly recovering um, a fundamental mode. Actually, as as it's seen on the uh, on the maybe the um, the the winter months of the OBS data. And then uh, as we move the source uh, in the sedimentary basin, we can see now uh, the higher mode starts to dominate, uh, which is very comforting for our interpretation of what might be going on. Uh, so we try to go even further and, and, and maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but um, we were thinking what can, what can affect uh, changes in sources location. So we thought about the North Atlantic storm track and then we were thinking that this is actually um, also modulated by um, atmospheric teleconnection uh, patterns, uh, such, such as uh, the NAO, which is a dominant one. So the, the main idea here is that uh, having different changes in the phase of the NAO, so either positive or negative, you would have a, 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 a change in the direction of the storm track in the North Atlantic. And 
having this change uh, as you go in towards negative um, NEO phases, you could see here as the low pressure systems are moving, you would end up with uh, opposite waves interactions uh, more, more closer to uh, average latitudes, whereas, whereas in um, uh, positive phases, you might end up with opposite interactions uh, further north, basically. Uh, and this could explain maybe having um, dominant um, really fundamental mode in, in times where the NAO will be positive and having uh, dominant higher modes in times where the NAO will be negative, basically. Uh, so, as I was saying, yeah, we try to connect those observations with the NAO. So to do that, uh, we derived um, some kind of, it's called here a HM index. Uh, the detail, I'm not going in the detail, but you can, we had a publication in GRL in 2021 with uh, the details on how we calculate the index. But it's basically an index that kind of um, uh, is determined based on the relative dominance between uh, fundamental and higher mode cross-correlation coefficients. So we try to then compare that index with um, the daily NAO index and also the monthly NAO index. And it's not, it's not a perfect correlation, but um, there is some interesting uh, similarities that are going on. Uh, the main issue being that uh, here we are um, only looking at eight months. Uh, so ideally, it would be good to look at least at a year or even more um, in the on the data. Uh, so I didn't put it here, but there has been uh, recently uh, a survey um, in um, in the North Atlantic. Maybe you've heard of it, the CSIS uh, experiment uh, with uh, the PI Sergey Lebedev. So we started looking at, at, at data from there. I'm not showing it here, but uh, uh, you have to trust me, it looks encouraging that over a long term, uh, this, this trend is, is recovered as well. Um, but it's kind of preliminary, so I didn't show it here. Uh, so in terms of the conclusions, uh, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, conclusions here. Uh, as I was saying, yeah, the strong interactions from the shelf uh, lead sometimes to secondary macro seismic locations uh, using uh, beamformed arrays, so it's something to be uh, aware of when, when interpreting the, the signals. Uh, on the origin of love waves, um, so the, there is a steep, uh, yeah, there's a contribution yeah, from steep seafloor morphologies, and, and we looked at in particular um, subsurface interfaces with high velocity contrasts and sedimentary basins are a good example. Um, in contrast, the relay to love wave conversions along the macrosis uh, pass. Um, may not of, may offer a more limited uh, contribution. Um, and again, I think this is quite interesting. As I was saying, as we observe uh, some structural control on the amount of love waves generated in the ocean, it, it seems that it's really the, the Rayleigh waves amplitude that are strongly modulated by the bathymetry and geological environment. And those amplitudes that will be mainly uh, affecting the changes in the love to Rayleigh wave ratios. Um, uh, yeah, on the few slides I just showed now, we looked at significant changes in the excitation of um, really higher modes based on changes uh, in secondary micro source locations. And they seem to be kind of um, highlighted by this uh, sedimentary basin uh, offshore Ireland. So we interpreted those fluctuations to be um, associated with a changing storm track in, in the North Atlantic. That is, uh, uh, modulated mainly by the NAO, but there is other uh, uh, teleconnection patterns in, in, involved, obviously, and we probably should look at those as well, but the NAO being the most dominant, uh, that's what we, we went for. Uh, so thank you for your attention. That's it.